so um, so uh, about three years ago, um, my wife Emily Mortimer was uh, had been asked to be on the the jury for the Sloan Foundation screenwriting competition, and the way that she normally does things is wait until the last minute and in this case uh, that that habit held true and it was the night before the deliberations and she was lying in bed next to me just cramming through uh, 20 scripts and I kept hearing them uh, after you know a few pages just thumping onto the you know ground next to me and I was lying in bed waiting for her to finish and one script seemed uh, not to, to make that sound dropping and she started flipping through pages and uh, she got to the end of it and she handed it to me uh, in my sort of stupor and said I, I really think that we should produce this and I read it and sure enough I agree um, we, we took Sean Snyder out for lunch um, and he had us at uh, also at decomposition <laughs> and um, what resulted was a really kind of old school low budget indie filmmaking process where we cobbled together a million dollars uh, and flew our Spanish DP over and put him up in my mom's apartment in Brooklyn and drove half the crew over the Verrazano Bridge every morning at 5 a.m. to uh, get to Staten Island where we filmed the movie. Um, and so it, it's just hard to believe that, that that process has yielded this kind of illustrious uh, um, institution giving us a screening here, and we're, we're so grateful for that. Um, here's Emily. <laughs> particularly who's here tonight because um, as, as, as well as this incredible place because there's something so magical to me about the fact that um, an institution like Sloan can can set up this bursary for screenwriters writing science-based material and um, a film student as brilliant and, and wonderful and poetic as Sean uh, is sitting at NYU thinking how can I cobble together some money to make a movie and um, and and hears about this grant and and sparks fly in his brain and he starts to write a script and a, a script that I don't think really would have existed unless um, unless that kind of uh, cry to arms had been made by by Sloan and Doran and and um, and he he was inspired to write a script mainly about grief but in order to try to get the money <laughs> that Sloan was offering he had to interweave it with all this very detailed specific science and it was it was a necessary part of the process and in so doing he discovered and we all discovered that the, 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 the truism is true that science is life that the, the, the human experience and and the sort of scientific experience is one and the same thing and that the death and birth and love and happiness and pain and sex and uh, all of it are all science and um and that that's i think the kind of the magic that came about from 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 this project and it's it's there up on the screen for you to enjoy and and it's um it's 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 all thanks to, to to Sloan and to Tribeca and to Sean being brilliant enough to to to, to take up the challenge and, and make this beautiful movie. So thank you to everybody and I hope you enjoyed as much as we Please join me in welcoming Sean Snyder, Gaza Rorig, and Gloria Dominguez Stranger to the stage. start with asking you a question, um, which is about Geza's character, Shmuel. Um, when you were thinking of him, oh, and first I just want to say that Jason, who co-wrote uh, this film with Sean, is here, and maybe he could wave and maybe give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Anyway, yes, sir. Uh, so when you guys were writing Shul's character, um, how did his obsession with, uh, you know, really the physicality, the biology of decomposition, make sense to you as part of his grieving process? I want to quickly inter yeah. intercept and just say I'm geeking out to be playing here at this institution <laughs> on this screen where I've seen so many incredible films and to be sitting next to Sonia who was uh, on the Sloan um, with Alfie Sloan when the script was being developed so a champion from like day one of a one page treatment of, the, of this film so I so so okay now your question <laughs> Um, it, it made sense because it, um, it was autobiographical in so, in so many ways. I lost my mom 10 years ago, um, and uh, I don't know, I think, that, I think it's autobiographical and I think that it's universal. I think that we all have these thoughts about um, not just our, our loved ones lost, but our own uh, inevitable ends. Um, and I think that we live in, in uh, a society and our respective cultures therein um, w do not encourage a very healthy relationship with, with death. So, so that unknown is uh, increasingly unknown and increasingly distant. And when you repress uh, you know, the worst possible neuroses manifest. And, and so I, you know, after my mom passed away, I had those thoughts, and I didn't engage them. I didn't go crazy with them. I thought that I was, you know, I think it, because we don't talk about them, when you do have those thoughts, everyone thinks you're, they're odd and macabre and morbid, and that shouldn't be appropriate to, uh, to grief and grieving. Um, and, I, and I realized that it's very natural, and I think that, that we all have those thoughts, and that if one wants to stare that reality in its face, um, as part of a grieving process, as any sort of existential check-in moment in life, that, that they, they A, should be allowed to do so, and, and B, that if you um, do stare in this space, and I'm incredibly squeamish, I think that, that I was sort of throwing the gauntlet down to, to myself in terms of making this movie and, and staring at these things in their decomposing faces, um, that, that if you get to the other side of that, there, there is a spiritual beauty in the biology, in, in sort of uh, our, the way that we return to the earth if allowed to do so um, unencumbered by, yeah, um, you know, th this notion that there's only, even, even as simply, uh, that there's only a limited amount of matter in the universe and we become other things, I think, you know, is, is beautiful, let alone other spiritual, uh, you know, biological nuances. Uh, so Gloria, um, one of the things you study is the relationship between people and their microbial environments, um, and, or their microbial colonies and how environments impact that. Um, and I think this film shows a lot of living people, which I know you study, but also, you know, uh, bodies of dead people, which have different microbial uh, communities inhabiting them. So I'm wondering if you can, I know that there is this phrase, the necrobiome, that's not just a phrase, but a thing, and maybe you could tell us a little bit what that is and what its role is and maybe what some of the microbes are. Yeah. So first, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I've enjoyed the film. This is the second time I see it. And uh, of course, you know, it's great to be with uh, such a talented artist. Um, I study the microbiome of life, <laughs> and my concentration is really newborns and how babies assemble their, their microbes. But uh, because of this, I had to study. So I've been studying the microbiome, and the people who does that, I, I know at least three people. One of them is my friend, um, Metcalf. Uh, she works in Colorado. And, you know, one of the beauty, and I've been thinking about it, is, you know, the body dies, we, we die, but our microbiome remains, and in a way, bacteria, they never die, because they divide, they, they are one cell, they divide in two, so there, there is not mom and daughter, there, there is a, they split into two cells, two daughter cells, and 
those microbes that have lived with us since birth uh, survive us and then they get integrated uh, their metabolism uh, made our molecules to go in the air and in the back to nature so I like to always to think of uh, places where people are buried as places where the molecules of those peoples you are breathing and you know the trees are uh, growing thanks to their bodies and uh, there is some kind of poetry there uh, so microbes survive and some of the microbes that are strictly human die as well and the soil takes over uh, but at the end we all return to nature even people who are cremated so carbon all the organic matter carbon hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen will go to the air so people breathe it and the animals breathe it and, and the inorganic matter goes back to the soil so like what uh, Matthew Roderick's character says at the end when they're driving about fertilizer. Um, so Geza, thank you first for your amazing uh, performance. Um, <laughs> so uh, I know this because we've spoken before, but more than the average person, um, you're familiar with the physical aspect of death. Um, and I was wondering if you'd feel comfortable telling the audience why and sort of what it's like to be around corpses and if any of that, uh, uh, how that informed your uh, sort of inhabiting Shmuel. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so there is this thing called Hebra Kadisha, which should be translated as Holy Brotherhood. And um, basically, these are units, groups of men or women, or um, three of them are washing, just like a newborn has to be washed before the big journey called life, so is a corpse has to be washed after the journey called life, and also before another journey. Okay. So um, I've been doing that for, I don't know, 15 years at least, and um, <coughs> It had some practical benefits for me because I had no green card and I needed to have somebody to keep myself over the water. But more importantly, soon enough I, I discovered that this is a, a very uplifting experience for me. So um, I'm already a citizen of this country and I'm still doing it. Um, just because it's transformative. And, and, it's, and most of the people who do it would, would also testify that there is, there is something sacred about it. Um, you know, we, we have so many religious activities, giving charity and praying and, and whatnot. Often you do the right thing, but somehow it does not work on you. When, when, when at least uh, I, I can tell you, even though I've done hundreds of times, e each and every time, it's an extremely, not just sobering, but, but uplifting experience. And, and partly, I, I, we could ask, why so? Or, you know, because it's not, you know, in cases, it's really not easy. Especially if the family is out, especially if the deceased is a younger person. An untimely death, not to mention even worse things, suicide. Um, but I, I guess the way Judaism views the bodies is, is, is different than I guess most, most religions. The, the general feeling in, in, among people who are interested in spiritual things is that the body is just the body. You know, the real thing is, is, is the soul and, and, um, and the future is the soul. You know? I don't know any other religion that believes the resurrection of the body. So there is, this, is, this is really something very life performative that somehow Jews can't let the body go. We are extremely um, thankful for the body. Mm -hmm. And even though 
most religions do keep the body on a short leash. And, and, you know, we, underst we understand, of course, that we are not here to serve the body because the body is not interesting in anything else but its own comfort. Mm -hmm. Yet, the intersection of body and soul is what gives us the free will. In other words, the reason why life, life is so precious because, okay, fine, let's imagine they all go to heaven. You know, let's hope, right? We go to the right place. What are we going to do there? In other words, the, what sort of relationships can be formed? Who are we going to help there? Who's, who's, who's needy there? What, what is going to be really the source of, of joy, which is down here? It's, it's nothing is as great as to relate to a person and to help somebody. But if everybody sees the truth and it's nothing else, then you can't deviate from the truth, so to speak. So even the afterlife in Judaism is imagined somehow down here in body again. Really um, so, Gloria, from what you said before, I'm very curious uh, if your study of microbes, and uh, it could be that you've never thought about this, or maybe you have, but ha ha um, understanding that maybe microbes have this life after death or continue in this way, has, that, has studying them impacted uh, your view of what life is at all? You know, um, like, do you... How much do you consider microbes a part of a person, and what happens to them when they die? And if they were to go on, you know, do you, is that sort of like the person going on? You know, some people believe that if they give their liver to another person, like a, then that's a part of that person, um, you know, living on in, in some way. And so, I don't know if that's the most articulate question, but has, basically, has your study of microbes impacted what you think about life? So the thing is, the human body harbors bacteria and fungi that only live in the human body. So they eventually they will also die, mm -hmm. but although some of them may pass to other animals or, so the environmental part of us may survive and be picked up by other forms of life. Uh, some, a lot of our bacteria will die because there is no humans to, to live on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess those also form part of the, you know, natural cycle of uh, organic matter. Um, but I, I think they survive us for longer. And, and actually, as they show there, the composition starts inside out, which is something that is not that um, uh, intuitive. Mm -hmm. People always think, you know, the earth will provide the microbes that will degrade and the insects and everything starts inside and then outside. Um, so I, I think, you know, in a way, the microbes also go, at least the strictly human microbes. And uh, there is, a, I just want to mention, there is something that survives and in, in a matrilineal way. And that is the humans are seeded with microbes by the mothers. And the process starts at, at labor and birth. And those microbes are the, are the pioneer ones. Those are related, uh, are the same microbes that will live in the females and will colonize the vaginal canal and will be passed to the next generation of boys and girls. But the girls will again continue. So there is a matrilineal inheritance of microbes that I also find very poetic. It's a little like the mitochondrial DNA that is passed through generations. Uh, so those microbes are passed within families via uh, the reproductive tract of women. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I'm wondering uh, for something that I think is really beautiful in the film, Sean and Geza, this is specifically for you, but um, is that religion and science don't really seem to come into conflict. You know, Schmuel's, uh, he has a very open, open, he's very open to science and he has a lot of curiosity and he's also, you know, looking to it 
for certain answers, and it doesn't seem to come into conflict with his religious beliefs, except that he has to, you know, sort of go outside of the bounds for certain answers. And this film also has a lot of truths in it. Like I think it's really beautiful the 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 story of the the kids and the dibuk because that also seems to work. You know that that in the film, like you know, they blow the shofar and then he's mending the coat. Like that has its own truth to it too. Um, so I wonder. For either of you, um, maybe this came from making the film or not, but if there's a spiritual component to looking at the physical universe for either of you, if you find that. I think absolutely. Um, the, the idea of the film, you know, I, I set out writing it um, being humbled by, I, I have a reformed Jewish background and, and I uh, um, boldly uh, presumed. I know, I know what Hasidic Judaism is, it's just what I know, but more serious, and I couldn't have been <laughs> more wrong about that. And, and so on, on one hand, I, you know, I went down the, the rabbit hole of investigation uh, into the Hasidic world um, and felt very beholden to uh, accuracy and, and also just a respect for, for the tradition. And on the other hand, I didn't know what happened to, uh, to a body. Um, I assumed that one might Google it and find a pretty simple answer, and there would be no drama, and the movie would not have been written. But instead, I found um, forensic anthropology, which is this in insanely uh, fascinating field of science, also an incredibly young field of science. Um, and. I, I assumed, um, starting out, you know, the, the hypothesis was that as I went down these separate rabbit holes, there would be a point of intersection, sort of studying Kabbalistic mysticism and, and getting to the, the way that a, a body decomposes. And I think, again, that there, there are nuanced ways in which, you know, that's what Shmuel's looking for, and, and those things do, do intersect. Um, but I also think overriding all of that is the intensely personal way in which an individual grieves. And that grief is as idiosyncratic as the relationship between the person who is lost and the person who's left behind. And what it takes to honor that person who's lost and what it takes to um, you know, get through that loss is so specific and, and, and personal. And, and we have to be humble for that as well. And so I think that while there are all these very you know, specific inter intersections, uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of unknowns, and I think that, that humility before those unknowns is spiritual in its own right. Uh, so humility before the infinite ways in which uh, a, a soul might be reconciled with its God, the infinite ways in which a body might return to the earth, and the infinite ways in which an individual uh, might grieve are, you know, are um, profound and, and spiritual. Um, you know, there is this rather simplistic notion that somehow religion and science, you know, they oppositional forces or something. I think some silly, you know, opinions hold that it's like a seesaw. You know, the more you know, the less you believe, and the more you believe, the less you know. This is this the, the arrogance of coming from, from, from the Enlightenment. I think it's by now anybody who either religiously or scientifically did his homework. Mm -hmm. I think by now you know that the more you know, the more wonder you have about the complexity of the of the, the universe. And um, as someone said, uh, you know, science is interested to take things apart and to see how they work, and religion is interested to put things together or back and see, see, see what they mean. So they're really not um, you know, competing territories at all. I, and I think, unlike the case of Galileo, Galilei, I guess the most known case, in, when the Inquisition put a ban on a scientific discovery of a heliocentric um, solar system and all that, and I think Jews generally revise and have never had an issue uh, with science. Um, I'm just, just uh, studying a few days ago a book called Ber Hagola, in which the Maharal, who is a rabbi in Prague, 
is talking about uh, different natural phenomena like the, the rainbow or an eclipse. And then in Hebrew, in the 16th century, he explains that the rainbow is because of the light and the raindrops, or the eclipse is because of different planets and their orbits cross each other. That's, and then he goes on for another 10 pages to say that, quoting the Talmud, that there are certain scenes that are related to the eclipse. So if you are reading it superficially, you would say, oh, what a primitive view. Don't you know that eclipses are predictable for decades? And you know, there's nothing to do with how humans behave. It's just the way. But if you really understand what he's saying, he says, I know why eclipses are. My question is not that. He's bothered as a believer. Eclipses seem to be like mistakes. People usually get scared of eclipses. It's dark, it's shadow, it's the middle of the day, it's weird. Couldn't God create the world without eclipses? Certainly he could. So his question as a rabbi is not how eclipses are being produced by the cosmos. He knows better than you. His question is why there are eclipses. The world could be quite well without a rainbow too. Why there is a rainbow? So he, in other words, religion and science go very well side by side. They don't uh, uh, really are uh, fighting with each other. And as Rabbi Sox said it most very well, of course, there is bad science, and there is bad religion also. Bad science could be, you know, the gas chamber is very famous. It's chemistry, it's science, right? Or, or, or the, the Hiroshima is all science, right? But the answer for bad science is not no science. The answer for bad science is curing cancer is good science. And the answer for bad fundamentalist idiotic religion is not no religion. Mm -hmm. The answer for bad religion is good religion. And did you, you and uh, Matthew Broderick's character have a, you know, a great uh, sort of partnership um, on screen. Did you feel that same sort of, you know, ability to go back and forth uh, when you were making the film? You know, like, did you, did you find any tension, you playing your character and him playing his character, between religion and science in, in your worldview? Or did you, did it really play out like we saw? Um, well, it's, I, I don't really know closely about what Matthew is believing or his personal worldview, but I'm sh I, I guess out of the two of us, I would be more religious. <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean, of course, that you know he, how spiritual, uh, great or deep person he is. And and I I think that uh, first of all, uh, Sean would be much more uh, qualified to talk about this. But we have very little money, and we have like few days. Twenty was it? Yeah. So we got, we have to be extremely focused. And unfortunately, I wish. We didn't have all that much past time with Matthew to, to really schmooze and to get to know each other all that well. But um, but I think that it was an extremely um, unreaching experience, I think, both for him and me. Um, so, Gloria, I'm curious what, we, what, what you do um, you know, in your real life and what we see in the beginning of the film with washing the, the corpse. Um, I think there, there's an idea of, well, I mean, it's a practice of cleanliness, I guess, or of cleansing, I think, maybe. And, um, you know, for me, like, learning about microbes everywhere, especially, like, the microbiology of the indoor environment, it's you're basically learning that you're living with, like, ten kinds of spiders and millions of kinds of microbes all the time. And this idea of, you know, who you're inhabiting, what you're inhabiting the world with, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this idea of cleanliness, so to speak, or cleansing, and um, how how different environments, uh, you know, react to that. Um, you know, or is there such a thing as cleanliness? You know, like what what does that mean in terms of microbes? So, 
Microbes and bacteria in particular were the first forms of life. So this is a microbial planet and will always be uh, as long as you know there is life in the planet. So any, any life that have evolved after bacteria were in the presence of bacteria. So, and what happened were fusions and integrations in systems. We, we have on our cells an, an ancestor of a bacterium in our mitochondria. And the plants have also an organelle that you, used to be a bacterium. So those are fusions. And then we have associations. So each one of us and each animal and each plant is an ecosystem by itself. And, and those microbes are needed for health. So this, this was revolutionary when we discovered that at the turn of the century, yeah, less than 20 years ago. Because we thought that after the human genome and the human genome, we sequence the human genome, you know, presidents present the human genome, uh, you know, in the White House. And, and then we discovered that most of this is not coding proteins. Uh, it's all regulatory, it's so complex. And then we discover, thanks to sequencing technology, that we have thousands of other genomes upon us regulating our own genome. So it, it was revolutionary because we then understood it's very complex. And there is a phenomenon that you may have heard of uh, called the hygiene hypothesis, um, in which, you know, it's it tries to explain the phenomenon of uh, societies that control infectious diseases then screw the immune system. So the price to control infectious diseases seems is, is being, in our urban societies, a rocket epidemic increase in malfunctions of the immune system and in met metabolic system. So we we, we were extremely antimicrobial with good reasons. Microbes killed us, you know. Uh, there were epidemics and as humans, you know, lived in uh, dense sites, the, uh, high density population, epidemics appear and they, they you know, the plague and we, we are extremely traumatized by that. And that was, you know, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, uh, Pasteur and other microbiologists were extremely antimicrobial because, and they developed vaccines to immunize us. So the immune system was discovered. They tried to manipulate the immune system uh, vaccinating. Uh, and then antibiotics were discovered in the 30s, in the 20s, but then applied in, in the 40s, in the late 40s. And they were life saving. Uh, because we could finally control these bad plagues that killed us and has have killed humans for since forever. Uh, but now we are starting, only starting to understand that the same tools we use to kill the bad guys are also killing the good guys, and that is affecting our physiology. So. The other component is, so humans are, first, mom is the environment. So human acquires first the mother bacteria, then the rest of the body sites of the mother, the, the mother kisses, the mother holds the baby's skin bacteria, then the siblings, the father. It's very human environment. But there is a point in which babies, when they already have enough development of their brain, sensorial, locomotion, they can move, they can, then they intensively explore the environment and they lick everything and they lick the floors. And then if you put two kids together, they lick each other. It's like, <laughs> it's a, such an instinct. We never have an intense interaction with the environment as toddlers do. And we think that phase is also important for the non-self microbial world recognition and is training the immune system. So we have become extremely paranoically clean. We, we want to clean everything. But there is this trauma that we are carrying that microbes are bad. Uh, even today, you know, Purell is everywhere and uh, extensive bathing and washing. And 
uh, I th we think we are starting to understand why it's bad to overdo it. And we, we need to come to terms and try to see how do we uh, optimize our antimicrobial compulsion. And, and respect our good microbes. That was a long answer. No, that's <laughs> great. Starting with the origin of very the <laughs> Yeah. And it, it makes you rethink godliness and cleanliness. Yeah. And, um, but I, um, as sort of a, a parallel, uh, and Geza, you, you probably have more knowledge about this than, than I do. I was doing a Q&A at a festival in Miami recently with a, a rabbi, and he, w and he was basically saying that we, we, we try to purify and wash the body, but even religiously, you can't purify the body and you can't purify the soul, despite your efforts to do it. And I just think it's, you know, I, that might be true. I, we, can, we can kill a lot with, with Purell, but there's also a lot of other things that are gonna slip by too. Um, and I don't know, I think it's something beautiful and, and human and, and humanistic about, about Judaism specifically, that even if you can't actually purify a soul, Maybe you can help it on its way, <laughs> or that you do the act anyway. Yeah, and that there's a parallel between the body and the, yes. the soul. Um, yeah. I mean, this is nothing you know, only Jewish. This is the, 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 it's something distinctly human. The animals don't marry. They really just leave each other out there, <laughs> and no matter you know what tribe or continent you go. People do do bury and and um, death is somehow and the corpse itself somehow is is viewed with reverence. So if 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 you, if you are around a dead person, you immediately instinctually you wanna turn on the radio, for example. You just feel that this this situation and even though scientifically you can call it an it, right? But but it makes no somehow sense humanly. We can't accept truly a fact that him or her just just be, in, a, in a second or in a minute all, all becomes an object. So so I think um, you know washing and, and before washing watching. You know they don't, in, Jew, in Jewish religion you're not supposed to leave a human body unguarded just to make sure that nothing is wrong being done to him or her. He has to be always supervised by, if not the family, then a paid, what is called a showman, a watcher, just to be there. Now, unlike other religions, we don't wait, as you could hear in the movie, yeah. we don't wait much. We try to bury everybody before sundown, in case it's someone dies it, you know, right after sundown, then before the next one. So, we, and, and uh, we don't, Cremate aut autopsy is not again done um, out of respect to the body because after all, you know the body is not the one that let's say wants to steal, but you force almost sort of rape your hand by stealing with it, right? And you can lie or you can kiss with your lips. It's really up to you. You are the one who set the agenda. You, you, not the body, right? So you can't blame the body truly for anything. It's you, you are the one, you, the body is just a tool. And so I think it's only right after being served by the body for 70, 80, hopefully 120 years, <laughs> is to really, it's to, to, have, to, to have a farewell, so to speak, and I found it even on the script level, and, and now watching it, the movie for like the tenth time, it still somehow uh, warms me how what this movie is, is tackling, what what what, because it's really usually we don't go there, right? This this uh, Shmuel is somehow is fascinated by the somatic aspect of death. It's not just losing her. It's, it has a special angle to it, and it's so hard, I mean, God forbid, really, truly, to lose a spouse with whom you have this special intimacy, right? Yeah. That what a man and a woman can, and then losing that, and, and, and plus, of course, it's not just folklore and the, case, and the sake of aesthetics. We can surely assume that they were both in their late, you know, teenage years, both virgins, when they got married, this is the only body they knew. And it's sort of frightening to now to get 
dating or to have this, you know, I mean, like it's, it's, a, it's, so I, I am just, can't be more happier to somehow to be part of this movie and I, and I, and I am very glad that Sean beat me for it. As am I. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious if anybody in the audience has any questions uh, for any of our people. Yeah, up there. Mark. So bacteria colonize all the mucosas of our body. That is the epithelium that covers our skin, our mouth, our ears, our eyes, uh, you know, all, all the exposed parts of the body plus the gut. And the, the digestive tract, strictly speaking, is outside the body. Strictly speaking, it's a hole that traverses us and is permanently exposed to external matter, which is the diet. Bacteria grow there, both in the epithelium, but also in the food. So, but what keeps bacteria in their places and their forbidden territories is the immune system. So all the time we are cutting ourselves when we eat, we cut our, our skin, Bacteria are there and they don't enter. They don't enter to forbidden territories, to the blood and internal organs because of the immune system. When you die, there is no constraints anymore. There is no immune system. And also, if you are immunodepressed, these friends of you that you know, kept you healthy will kill you. Uh, lung is, is one of the, you know, all people will eventually die of of pneumonia because their their immune system fails to keep those guys in there they, to, cook, to keep the good friends in there in the within their boundaries uh, when you die then you become food for your own bacteria first and then also bacteria from the soil okay. I see there in the middle in the back yes Um, I started uh, with a lot of reading. Let me just repeat. Right. It, was, it was how did Sean go about learning about uh, his center culture? Um, there were lots of stages and, and lots of advisors and, and consultants at, at various points of the process. Um, to kind of walk through it, I, I started with a lot of reading. And then it's, it's very interesting because you have to find some inroads into this world, but you have to find folks who have um, one foot in the world and one foot out of the world, who are, or who are in the world but open-minded enough to, to talk to you, and folks also who have left the world. Uh, and I often found, well, well, from all three of those categories, I, I learned a lot and incorporated a lot, um, that sometimes the folks who have left the world aren't necessarily the best, most reliable narrators <laughs> about, about the world. Um, so you're trying to gauge that as well. And, and, and this was never supposed to be a story, despite all of the, the blasphemy that it dabbles in, that disrespected the religion. And it was also not the story of somebody who needed to escape the religion. It was somebody who loved their faith and their community and was trying to reconcile these human and divergent thoughts with that faith and community. Somebody who, who ultimately wanted to return and, and not to leave. So, so uh, treating the religion with that authenticity and that love from the inside was, was uh, very important as well. Um, I uh, met with a, a Haredi, a Hasidic rabbi, uh, through mutual friends. Um, and we sat down and we had a very long conversation in the development stage of the film. I reached out to uh, Footsteps, the organization Footsteps, which is heavily featured in the documentary One of Us on Netflix. And they help uh, folks who are in the Hasidic community who are questioning um, whether they want to, to remain, sort of uh, wrap their minds around self-determination uh, and what that means for them. Um, and 
they understandably are very protective of, of their their clients, but they uh, handed me off to uh, what I call um, a Hasidic speakeasy, essentially, and, and it's sort of uh, fringe and, and former Hasids who gather uh, on uh, one night every week in rotating rotation uh, locations um, and start meeting at midnight and the party rages until <laughs> five in the morning and, and there's men and women commingled and there's folks who are uh, present as Hasidic and there's folks who have, but are not religious themselves any longer and there's folks who have left um, but still have a spiritual tie. Uh, and in that community, um, speaking to folks in that community and the man who, uh, who's this incredible uh, man who's, who, who is passionately uh, in the Hasidic community, but set this safe space up for sort of all souls at various stages of their journey. Uh, through folks in that community, through speaking with, with the man who runs that community uh, or, or enables that community, there was a lot uh, that went into the writing of the script. There was a lot of consulting on, on the accuracy afterwards. And when we, um, and when we were on set, so, so Alessandro, Nivola uh, had not yet been cast in Disobedience. I don't know if you had a chance to see Disobedience this past year. He started the To Dust journey, and, and, him, and, and him and M must have some fascination with the Hasidic world, because M had been in a short where she played a Hasidic woman. And then, lo and behold, a year into sort of development on To Dust, Alessandro gets cast as a rabbi in, uh, in Disobedience. And so he researched and trained a lot. He found a contact in the Hasidic community in Brooklyn um, who helped him very intimately prepare for that role. And then when the time came uh, to, uh, to shoot to dust, Zalman, uh, his, his friend in contact, came on to our film as an, uh, an onset advisor. Um, Geza's own religiosity uh, played a role in Geza's own contacts uh, and friends. There's a lot of folks in the film who are extras who are actually Hasidic. Zalman ended up in the film, uh, Zalman's son, Ended up in the film is as well. Is Alessandro in the the magazine? Alessandro is in in the magazine. <laughs> the, the body farm. He's in the body farm. Yeah. Alessandro is a master of disguise. <laughs> he grows a beard, and this uh, you know this Italian man looks uh, can completely passes as a Jew. He puts glasses on, and he's unrecognizable. Um, and I just want to. Following up on that, on the science side, I know you had a science consultant uh, who uh, had something to do with the body farm, and maybe you went there and maybe you didn't. I don't actually know. Do you want to just tell folks a little bit about that? Um, we had uh, scientific advisors from from uh, pretty much day one, thanks to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Had a scientific advisor, uh, uh, Jason and I, while we were writing the script. and. She was so impactful on, on the direction of the script and what we could and couldn't get away with. Um, and it's interesting because you're, you're, you were ultimately beholden to, to accuracy and sometimes it feels like it's a trap. On one hand, you know, we're in between these two worlds and these two walls and one is the religious and one is the scientific and you want to make something happen dramatically. But you, you're pinballing between these two. Yeah. And, and what I love is that it was only by being beholden to those two and not taking the easy way out dramatically that we came across really interesting fascinating answers and solutions. And so much of the research into the science led to not only the accuracy of the film, but some of the absurdity of the film, like the fact that pigs are used um, and we're dealing with a Hasidic man, or the fact that body farms I exist. Um, but there were certain things that we kind of wanted to do when we were walking the fence, and, and they manifested themselves in the script one way, but we had dreams about, a lot of questions about how, how intact her body would be at the end. Um, and our first scientific advisor, um, basically said that body would be uh, a complete uh, decomposing wreck, no, you know, five months, six months on. Um, so we created something in, this, in, in, this, in the original script to satisfy her that I called a, a sort of a, a tarp taco. It was like a, they, they would have to scoop her up in a, in a tarp and carry her in a, in a tarp versus just in the shrouds. And then later on in the process, uh, Donnie Stedman, who is the head of the body farm in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is the original body farm facility, became our scientific advisor uh, in development and heading into production on the film. And she is, is arguably one of the leading experts in the world on these things. And I flew down. I had gone to a body farm in 
in Texas, uh, where they were incredibly generous with their time and with their answers, but they did not let us in past the fence, which, and I'm sitting there, I'm saying, but how would one get in? And she says, I, they'd have to break in. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> so that's what's gonna happen. Um, and then I traveled down to the body farm in, in Tennessee, and even with uh, my Sloan accreditations, they, they did not, she did not let me into uh, past the fence, um, which sparked a really fascinating conversation about the ethics of forensic anthropology, and I was certainly humbled uh, by that and, and came out understanding um, all of the reasons why she, she wouldn't let me pass. Um, but she was incredibly helpful and insightful, and in the end, going right into production, she validated these, these dramatic ideas that we had, this, this sense that um, if you get six feet below, um, temperature is kind of canceled out, and insect life is kind of canceled out. So it is entirely feasible that that body, a very long time after burial, has not uh, decomposed significantly. Um, in any way, and, and, I, and I do think that I was fascinated as we were writing the film, again, this, this is a new field of science that moves at breakneck paces, and in the course of the development, production, and editing of the film, I remember reading one article about a study that said, well, well we're, because there are so many infinite minute factors that affect the way a body decomposes, pigs may no longer be an apt uh, equivalent for the human body. And then another article that I read was very specifically about the necrobiome and how this is the cutting edge in forensic research, forensic anthropological, anthropological research, and this sense that uh, this is a layman's way of summing it up, but, but that the, the, the way one, the, the, the environment in which a person dies, the last breath that is breathed, whether it's in a hospital or in a home, and the uh, bacteria that enters the body you know, in those final moments based on that environment, will actually affect the pace and way in which your body decomposes. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think I'm running out of steam and I don't know how to go back to the original question. Because <laughs> don't ever breathe the last one. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to add, um, I don't know if you've been in Guanajuato in Mexico, there are some areas in the planet, and so for life you need water. There are some areas that are so dry that bodies de dehydrate and then they don't decompose. That and they become mummified. And if you go to Guanajuato, they have a museum that is very impressive of all these uh, people, people's bodies that are quite intact, just dehydrated. They still have the teeth, the hair. Uh, they won't decompose, they, they were uh, dry, and there is no life without water. So it, it's very dependent also on the conditions of the, of the earth, of the uh, environment. Uh, we, we have to wrap up unless anybody has a last burning question. Yeah, there, hand up. Um, yeah. So you said before about how we inherit our microbiome from vaginal birth. I remember reading that that a long time ago, and I was, I'm not saying this to be funny, but uh, can you increase your microbiome diversity? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, like yogurt or kimchi. Nature has a timing for everything. So, birth happens only once in your life. You go through, if you're lucky to be born naturally, you'll get your mom microbes, and those will colonize, will, will be the first one that the immune system of the baby sees, and will colonize all body sites of the baby. By day three, you can already tell with the microbes what is the mouth, just swabbing. I could tell you this is the mouth of the baby, this is the skin, or this is the poop. Uh, at birth, you can't. It's all mom's vaginal microbiota. Uh, a lot of mothers have, so we are doing a study now <coughs> where we um, restore the microbial exposure of C-section for babies. And we are trying to see if they become more normal microbiologically and also follow them and see if they have less asthma and obesity and celiac disease and all the diseases associated with C-section and antibiotics. And a lot of moms ask me, oh, my baby's four months. 
can I see my can I see the baby and still get a benefit? Uh, and again, I say nature has its timing, uh, and what we are doing is try to reproduce nature. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a, we don't understand so many things, but we have enough. Um, we have learned enough to understand that whatever is natural is the best. I, I also I feel like there's a in the you know, who gets the last word religion or science in some in some <laughs> regard and to sort of end on a on a on a point of synthesis. I you know you think about Shmuel and, and I think a lot of this film has to do with this question of immortality. Like what is what is immortality? Is it the soul? Is it our biology? Is it um, you know the the psychological characteristic traits that we pass along? Is it our you know the memories left behind of, of the person who's who's living and, and this sense you know very obvious very real and obvious but when you think about this vaginal microbial perspective that like Rivka is alive in Shmuel's sons who for so much of the of the film you know he's he's awash in his own grief as they are in theirs and there isn't that that connection but if you sort of think about where where is he to find Rivka without Rivka the other beautiful thing is to think that you know not in microbes necessarily but the molecules. So, you know, the air, all the millions of people that have lived in humanity uh, throughout the history of humankind, have their molecules have been reincarnated into organic matter, not only of humans, but also of animals, fungi, bacteria. Uh, so as long as life exists, it recycles itself into a diversity of forms and shapes and the it will it would only end i think when the uh, earth ends when there is no more life on earth then probably we can think you know that's a, that's probably the end well, here's something. <laughs> 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 so thank, you. thank you i please join me in thanking sean for the Thank you guys so much for coming and just saying. Um, and I'll just say, uh, you know, please stay tuned to scienceandfilm.org for upcoming Science on Screen programs. The next one will be next month, March 24th, and we'll be showing William Wyler's Hollywood epic, The Best Years of Our Lives, um, with a talk about engineering prosthetics and the power and limitations of non-normative bodies. And to dust open theaters on Friday. So please tell your friends. Yeah, thank you guys.